Alright, good. everybody else who's here, um, everybody else online, welcome, um, we're glad you're here. So if you're in the lobby, you should come in here and worship with us. If you're in here now, thank you, let's stand and sing. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us tell the world of his great love our god is a god who saves our god is a god who saves let god arise let god Stand, she will endure. The church will stand, she will endure. He holds the keys of life, our God. Death has no sting, no final word. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise. Let God arise. your victory i'm gonna see your victory for the battle belongs to you lord yes i'm gonna see your victory i'm gonna see your victory for the battle belongs to you lord When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Yes, my God will never fail. Sing that out. Yes, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power. Jesus, yes, every war he wages, he will win, and I'm not backing down from any giant, because why? 
Cause I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends Yes, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Yeah Let's sing this out together take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good yes you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good yeah you take what the enemy meant for and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to Lord, yes, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Yes, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There is power. Yes, thank you, worship team. Y'all give him a hand clap of love. That's good. Yeah, thank you, worship team. Hey, welcome to church, y'all. So glad you're here. Last, last week, I introduced the new name of the church. Does anybody remember the new name of the church? Anybody? Water's Edge. Water's Edge Church. So we got water out here. We're on the edge of it. So here you go. A lot of people were made disciples on the water's edge. And then in the Bible, a lot of people encounter God at the water's edge in the Bible. So I'm excited about that name. Uh, giving, as far as giving is concerned, we're still giving in the old name because it's going to take us a while to work through the legalities of changing the name. So if you do write a check and put it in that box back there, or I don't know about giving online, I don't think that matters as much, but if you do write a check, make it to the old name so that, you know, until we get that worked out, which will be soon enough. So thank you so much. We have the uh, Super Bowl tonight. And I'm so excited about that, but it's going to be back here. We're going to have the game going inside. We're going to have fun going outside, too. And you can bring your kids and come and eat and just enjoy yourself. The idea is that you bring somebody that maybe wouldn't go to church, that maybe wouldn't come to worship, but they would come to a Super Bowl party. Uh, we're going to have fun. It'll probably not be Beyonce on halftime. It'll be Tim Hawkins. So if you know Tim Hawkins, we're going to play him on the screen during halftime. And it'll probably close after halftime and we'll go home. So maybe not going to watch the entire game. Uh, so glad you're here. Uh, I do have a word. Our next song is about going into the light and coming out of a grave. And it comes from the Bible and Jesus' story of dying and then being risen from the dead, coming out of a tomb, and walking his new life. And the Bible says that we all actually follow in that order, is that we were dead in our sins and trespasses, and then God made us alive. 
he canceled that debt against us, and we walked out of the tomb. It says in the word, for we have been united with him in his death like his, we shall also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Just as Jesus died, we die with him. We die to sin. Just as Jesus rose again, we rise again with him. And I just pray right now in the room that if you have not been risen from him, that you will feel that now, that you will encounter God now, and that you will make that decision to walk out of that grave. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for the worship right now that we can have freely. We pray that we can continue to worship and that nothing will hinder us. Protect this house, God. We ask that you'll send the gifts to this church, send the spirit to this church, send all we need, Father God. Take care of us. Praying, Father God, for more, more of your presence, more of your life in our church, Lord, more people, more of everything. We just want more. Praying for our Super Bowl party tonight, Lord. Give us victory in that. I pray, Father, for people from this community to come. I pray for people of this church to come. I pray, Father, for just a mirth, a joy to happen tonight. I pray, God that you will receive our worship, and we will receive the grace that comes in worship right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? of a way it was my turn to win till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Yeah. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name. Out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Yes. And now your mercy has saved my soul. And now your freedom is all that I know. Jesus, when I met you, yeah, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, yes, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Let's think about our journeys with God as we sing this next verse. I needed to rescue, my sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, yes, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, yes, 
Once you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Yes, you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are, and that is who you are, oh, that is who you are, and that is who you are, oh, that is who you are, and that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who
follow me. I hear the words, come, let me lead you. I remember the words which said, I am the good shepherd. You will hear my voice. Father, I just know that you lead us. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Father, you lead us. Thank you. We praise your name. We worship you. We're thankful, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, you can sit down. We missed uh, meet and greet today. Yes, my fault. Sorry about that, Connor. A lot of details, a lot of stuff. Um, so we, we talk up here a lot of times about um, stories in people's lives. you call testimonies, and they help us know kind of what God's doing in our church. And so I have another one of those today. We're doing another uh, Friday night worship night this coming Friday, and it, um, it will last 90 minutes-ish. It'll have a beginning and an end point, whereas last time was more like a drop-in party. This is more like a service because, uh, well, we needed to organize it a little bit, and we learned a lot from doing the first one. But God showed up in a lot of people's lives. And we prayed, we was like, Lord, we worship you tonight. Feed us, fill us, Holy Spirit, come. I love that prayer, Holy Spirit, come. You can pray that sometime if you want to. You just talk direct, directly to the Holy Spirit. It's like, hey, you're the comforter. <laughs> come, I need comfort. <laughs> Who doesn't need comfort? I need a lot of it. So I do have, um, I want you to have an expectation of meeting God in your life. I want you to have an expectation of encountering him. And so that's why we do the testimonies, because I, I want you to be able to have that kind of fun and have that kind of expectation in your life. So I was going to have Andrew Rice come up real quick. Just tell us what in the world happened to you, happened to you at the last worship night, and uh, try not to scare us too bad, you know? Here you go, buddy. Oh, this is a conversation? Hey. Okay, usually we got chairs up here, and it's more like casual. This, yeah, is, little... this is a little too formal. Okay, um, yeah, so we did worship night two Fridays ago on the 22nd. We showed up, and I mean, I can say, honestly, it was probably my first real encounter with the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know how else to put it. I don't know where else to put it in my life. Um, and there was a lot of... You know, the, the prayer that, that you talk about, Ross, there of Holy Spirit come, and, and that was kind of my whole week leading up to that, is saturating myself in the scripture of, of the Holy Spirit, because I never really explored that side of the Bible beyond, like, after Paul. Like, it all happened to him. God needed him. He's not going to do that to me. Like, I'm not that great. Um, and that, that's where I had put that in my life. And so we... we um, that's what we, we did is we um, just kind of sat, I, I saturated myself in, in this scripture with that in, in multiple ways and then fasted all day Friday as well, um, just, just deep in prayer and, and just came in here in this, in, like, really just begging the Holy Spirit to, to enter into my life because I just felt so empty and numb to my own spiritual self, if that makes sense. And, and I didn't know where I was or what God wanted me to do. And I knew just reading the Bible again, I, like reading through it and being like, okay, this is what I think it is. It just wasn't going to be enough. And I needed the Holy Spirit, and I, I still do every day. Um, but it, it like broke me in a big way because you can feel it, and it's a very natural occurrence even like today, like during worship, you can still feel like you feel the tingling in your back sometimes, like sometimes of uh, a piece of the chorus comes out, and you're like, wow, that really spoke to me, and your back gets all tingly. But this was like your toes to your head tingling for like a solid hour. Like you lift your arms, and like everything's shaking. Um, and like every word that you're singing feels like it's piercing your heart, you know? And you feel so broken, all you can do is cry. And then the Holy Spirit came upon me and just lifted me and gave me peace with everything. Um, and yeah, woo! 
Um, and I mean, Allison, we went, we went to go get food after that. I was like, I'm not hungry. I can't eat. Like, how could I eat after that? I didn't eat for 24 hours, but I'm like, I, there's, there's, I'm, I'm so full. Like, all I want to do is like, like start knocking on people's doors and be like, hey, <laughs> I know it's 1030 on Friday, but y'all got a Bible in here? Um, <laughs> but it's, and like, I don't, I don't want to make it like, I, I don't know. I don't want to go too deep into it because I'll, I'll drone on for years. But the, the point I'm, I think, because I've been praying on it all this morning too, is like, God, what do you want me to say in this? Like, what about this testimony? What about the testimony you've given me? Like, what is yours that, that you want everyone to know? Um, and and what, what he's telling me is that it's, it's here for everybody. And you have to invite it. And you got you to gotta make it ready. Like, you got to be ready for it. Like, mentally and your heart and everything. Because when it... If you're saying, like, I don't know, it's like, I tried to make this analogy, I don't know if it works, but, like, you invite somebody over, but you know your house is clean, they're not clean, so you invite them over, but you're hoping they say no, so they don't come to your dirty house, right? So you want, like, I wanted to have, like, a clean house, so when I'm asking the Holy Spirit to come, I'm like, yes, I want you to come. Like, I don't, I don't have, I don't know if that's a great analogy, but... It, it helped me to be like, no, I want like a clean house. Like, I want to be like saturated in the scripture. I want to like understand what God is going to use this for. And it's, I don't know, like my eyes feel open. Um, I'm like God is moving and I'm excited for it. And I'm stoked and I can't wait to just keep being a part of this. And I love you all. And that's it. Yep. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. Hey. Hey, listen, guys, I take a risk by letting you hear some of these stories because automatically, um, it's immature of us, but we do it anyways. Automatically, you start judging yourself. It's like, oh, well, I haven't had that experience. You know what? I haven't either. I mean, I've had similar kinds of things, but I didn't have it that night. And so anyways, that doesn't mean I can't celebrate what God's doing in him. And that doesn't mean I can't have anticipation that God will encounter me in some really crazy way. Um, I, I, Jesus says the Holy Spirit's like the wind and he blows where he wants to and you never know what, where he's going and you know, where it comes from, where it's going and so is those who've been born of the Spirit it's like it's an invisible process it's an amazing thing and um, I know that the Holy Spirit won't just show up one, once in your life but many times and he already has if you're breathing right now the Holy Spirit's showing up in your life <laughs> thank you for breath ah, Spirit uh, Ezekiel 34 15 through 16. Does anybody know the spiritual gift we're talking about today? All right. I heard some whispers. Shepherding. This is the, this is, shepherding is in the heart of God. Okay? Shepherding is right in the heart of God. And this is God's heart for it. It just comes out, oozes out of these, this passage. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. And I will bring back the strayed. And I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. You see, the shepherd goes after God's people that have strayed. The shepherd goes after God's people that are feeling weak. The shepherd goes after, the shepherd goes to love. The shepherd shows up almost like a superhero in somebody's life. The shepherd is somebody that cares so much about those who are in need. And the shepherd knows how to doctor the soul. And God's like, I'm going to do that. And you read this passage, he's like, I'm going to do it through my people. I'm going to shepherd my people through shepherds. And God needs badly to have shepherds that have his heart. He wants to bind up those who are injured. He wants to go after those who have strayed. He wants to strengthen those who are weak. And that's what he wants to do right now with you today. In this room, God wants to, to be your shepherd. And, and I think in very big way from Andrew Rice's story, God showed up in his life and just shepherded his soul. See how gentle that was? He like had this experience with the Holy Spirit that shepherded him and said, it said I, almost like a hug from God. It's just like a hug from God. Does anybody want a hug from God? Because a shepherd heart is to give you a hug on behalf of the Father. These shepherds are great. And I want to share with you the passion of a shepherd and a church lord with 
Out of Shepherd is a church that's not a safe place. It's a church where it's not a home. A church, a church without the shepherding gift is, is a church that's not very comfortable. It can get a little too crazy without the shepherds. These are your, and, and there's these types, there's shadows of these types in the world. But this type of the five is the caregiver, the defender, the peacemaker, the helper, the servant, the selfless, the healer. In culture, we find them as our elders, lovers, police, okay? Um, they have that same protecting, take care of, shepherding heart. Parents, mediators, military, counselors. What, what represent counselors in here? Health workers. Like, they're going to go to the hospital. They're going to help those people that are hurting. They're going to bind up the injured. They're priests, community workers, like your aid workers, first responders. Mother Teresa, she's like a shepherd. So that was her big thing. She, she, she operated in all the gifts, I think, well, except really the E. But she really was amazing in her ability to shepherd people. And Mother Teresa said, I'm going to go on the streets of Calcutta, and I'm going to shepherd the people that are dying on the streets. And she went lower and lower and lower in the, for the glory of God. She walks into a shop one day, and she's begging the shop owner. She says, hey, can you give me some money for the poor? And the shop owner spit in her face. And the reason he spit in her face is because she was exposing the depravity of the culture of Calcutta. And so he spit in her face, and she responded to him like a shepherd. That was for me. Now, do you have anything for the poor? That is an amazing shepherd. There's no heart she can't pierce and get into. There's no person she could not call and ask something from and they wouldn't give it to her. She had so much power in her gift. I guarantee you if she picked up a phone and wanted to talk to the president of the U.S. in her day, she could have asked for anything. He would have given it to her. Because that kind of person is somebody that everybody loves. And, that they, and because you know they love you. The shepherds are amazing. I'll tell you another shepherd from a, a, ma a masculine example, Chris Kyle, American sniper. Poof, he thought that America was under threat. And when a shepherd thinks that the sheep are under threat, oh, they get real. Mama bear, they get real. Chris Kyle, the American sniper, he just started laying out people because he figured if he didn't do it, then his home base was in threat. Because that's a shepherd's heart, protecting. These protectors is a shepherd's heart. Uh, in the Bible, you've got John the Apostle. He, according to Jerome, in his last years, before he died, they would call him up to the front of the church every, every Sunday. And he was old, and he would just crawl up. There's stories in Jerome, his commentary on Galatians. And he would just crawl up there like this and just wiggle woggle up there. And he would say, little children... This is John the Apostle. Little children. This is a shepherd for you. Little children. He just, just like a hen, just kind of takes them. He says, little children, love one another. If you do this, that is enough. See, the shepherd, you know a shepherd because they give everything and they take nothing. You know a shepherd because they feel that you're, you're, in, their, you're in their group. And you know a shepherd because of that, that you know a Christian shepherd because of that, this, that, that love. John the Apostle is an example. In our church, you got Larry Baker, man. You got Larry Baker. In our church, he's probably back there with the kids serving because he's a shepherd taking care of the kids. And, and, and when it comes to like a shepherding thing, to go talk to somebody, go after somebody, he does it. Yeah, I remember him going to Pillion to talk to somebody that random that came to church. I remember him going to Orangeburg. Somebody had knee surgery. He just went out to Orangeburg, talked to him. Shepherds will go after people, and they'll sit with people. They'll have a conversation with people, and they'll know how to get into the soul of someone. This is a counselor for you. They let you talk, and then they get wisdom, and then they feed it back into you, and they heal you. They help heal you. You, you shepherds, the supporting gift of a shepherd, you know, what, you know what one of them is? Healing. Healing, the power to heal. You know, the supporting gift of a shepherd is giving. Like, shepherds, 
give because they want to protect the community that they love. Shepherds give because they, they want to support the community that they love. They want it to flourish. They want it to grow. If we don't have givers in the church, like, it ain't going to happen. They're not going to work. You know, that, that woman with the main giver in the Bible was not so much giving a lot. It was that she gave everything she had. She just loved giving so much. She just had two pennies, and she's like, I'm going to just give these. Jesus pointed her out and said, now that's a giver. The giver is the supporting gift. One of the supporting gifts of a shepherd is that giving. One of the supporting gifts of a shepherd is healing. One of the supporting gifts of a shepherd is encouragement. Oh, my goodness, this woman I know named Stephanie Fritch. Oh, you get healed around her because she's so encouraging. She'll never tell you anything like crooked without giving you something good. She just knows how to feed into people and give them life. Encouragement, encourage, and giving them courage to live and be them another day. This amazing person, amazing gift, compassion, so many supporting gifts. The master shepherd was Jesus. Master shepherd was Jesus. And there's a story that I want to tell about him. But i got to read the passage first. So bear with me as we go to John 21. And we read through this story. Can y'all stand to your feet to honor the word of God for me? This one will take 19 verses. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. This is, this is his resurrection appearance. Simon Peter... Thomas, called the twin. Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. This is Peter. He's like, I'm going fishing. (laughs) Jesus is gone, so I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you, because he's the leader. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He showed up. Jesus said to them, children, Do you have any fish? And they said, no. And he said, cast the net on the right, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. See, this is the second time he's done this miracle. You know Jesus' stories. And that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. And then when Simon Peter heard it, it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment. He didn't take it off. He put it on. I don't get that. For he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. He didn't want to show up naked to Jesus. <laughs> and then verse 8, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about, about 100 yards. Peter went first. And when they got out they, on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in the place, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus, <laughs> he cooked them breakfast. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. Because Jesus was like, well, I'm the one that actually caught those fish, and I want to eat some of them. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Now, what is that number significance? I don't know. And go ahead, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Okay, so the miracle of the fish and the net. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Yes, now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was Jesus. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, well, feed my sheep. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, and then Peter was grieved. And this is a strong word. He was really, he probably was crying. He was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. You may be seated. Said to him, follow me. Oh my goodness, this story is so wonderful. Uh, Peter was despondent. He went back to fishing. He was depressed. He, he, he left Jesus. He was going back to his work. 
He's going back to the world. He's, he's returning to his old task. And Jesus was like, and, and Peter was like, man, I, I don't know what happened, but I know that I just denied the guy. And now what? So he goes back to what he was used to doing. And he's, he's feeling like regret because he just denied him. If you know the story, he just denied the guy who was his best friend. He denied him three times. And so now he goes back to work. And in, in, and in the work that he does, he's not even successful. Jesus is like, hey, did you catch anything? And he's like, no, they caught nothing. He caught nothing. He's a loser. He, he couldn't even go back to work and be successful. He's depressed. He's regretting. He's got guilt and shame. And then not only that, on top of everything, he can't even be successful at the thing he used to do. And his heart is hurting because he's not doing anything right. He couldn't do the Jesus thing right. He can't do the fishing thing right. He just wants to give up. And he's just trying to feed his face, man. He's just trying to make it. This guy, he's, he's, I think he's, he's left. And the disciples go with him. The disciples go with him. And at this moment, Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. He's there, guys, because in all the stories of Jesus' resurrection, he never reconciled them to himself. And this is a story of a shepherd reconciling the disciples back to himself. Jesus is going to have to go through a process of confrontation. And you watch this as a shepherd. You will get so much wisdom right now. If you watch this as a shepherd and see how Jesus shows up and reconciles these people, it was morning. The day was breaking. Jesus shows up on the beach. You can, he, you can see the sun shining on his face. He looks out, and there he is, Jesus, representing like new possibilities, a new day, representing the resurrection. This is such an exciting story. The first thing a shepherd does is a shepherd shows up. The first thing a shepherd does is show up. They show up. You know, y'all know Kike, right? Some of y'all know Kike. He was a preacher here before. He's like a superhero. Because whenever you want to see Kike, you never see him. But whenever you're, like, really struggling in the hospital up north, you know, like Travis Jacks, he shows up, doesn't he, Travis? But you want to be his friend when you get back, but he's nowhere to be found. Because he's a shepherd, because he's going to show up with the broken people. He's going to show up with the people that need him. Because, Jesus, because Kike is this kind of person that's, that wants to go after the strayed, wants to go after the hurting and the weak. And that's, that's the passion of a shepherd. I remember I was depressed up in Saluda. I hadn't seen Kike in forever. He shows up on my couch trying to encourage me in the middle of a dark time in my life. And I bet you if you were to raise your hand, he's done that for many of you in this room. Showed up in your life when you were hurting and you needed love and you, you were a hurting sheep. Hurting sheep. So just showing up is what shepherds do best. Jesus says, do you have any fish? And so the shepherd asks, how's that going for you? And for many of you who've left the church or gone, had forays or hiatus into the world, how'd that go for you? For Peter, he wasn't even successful back in the world. You would think that he goes back into the world, he catches more fish, makes money, does well, because, I mean, he hung out with Jesus, and surely that gives him some, some kind of knowledge. But no, how's that going for you? Oftentimes with the, with the sheep, it's not going well with them back out there in the world. And with Peter, it was not going well with him back out there in the world. And so Jesus starts by saying, Hi, here's a good shepherd question. How is that going for you? Answer, not good. Then he says, take your net and put it on the right side of the boat. So he takes the net, he puts it on the right side of the boat, and the miracle of the net and the miracle of the fish happen all at once. They, kept, they catch way too many fish that a net can hold, and, and, it's, and it's just incredible, and they start to go back to the shore to go to Jesus, and Peter jumps in and all that. You see, Jesus had already done this. Jesus had already done this before. Y'all remember the story when he was at the water's edge and he called his disciples to follow him and he had them catch fish? You see what he's doing? He's bringing them back to the day when they said yes to following him. He's like, you left your nets back there and followed me. And now you're going to go back to fishing? He's just, he's saying, do you remember? Do you remember? He's like, and I would ask you if you've, if you've ever strayed, if you're, and if you're a shepherd and you want to, do you remember when you said I will follow him? And are you ready to back up 
and say that never happened and you never did that? Because when you follow Jesus, you made a covenant with him. And if somebody's come to me before and they've been like, I'm not sure if I believe in God. And they start doing whatever they want and living how they want and kind of walking away from the faith. And I said, if you're not sure, you made a covenant. Think about it in marriage. You're not sure if you love her anymore. Are you just going to leave her while you're not sure? Don't do that. Don't just leave her when you're not sure. Wait till you're sure before you leave him. Wait till you're sure. Do you remember? Let's make sure that you know what you're doing, Peter, going back to fishing. You're a loser at fishing. You might have some success with me. Get back. Get back in the game. Do you remember? So he has this conversation. And then it's really interesting that Peter jumps in the boat. I mean, he jumps out of the boat. And he puts his clothes on. It's because there's no bikinis on Jesus' beach. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> he puts his clothes on and he goes to the beach. And what, what the good shepherd does is he throws the bait out there with a conversation by showing up. But he doesn't force it on you. Jesus waited for them, for them to come to him. Now, they could have turned the other way and gone out to sea. But they jumped out of the boat. He jumped out of the boat, and he comes to the fire. He wants to be reconciled. Sometimes you just need to say it once with somebody and leave it alone. And with a shepherd, you get all worked up about how the sheep is going astray. But you're not giving them the freedom to, to go astray or to come back when they want to. But Jesus does not berate them from the shore. You guys denied me. You guys stink. And, and just start correcting them like some people would. He actually waits until they come his way before he has the conversation. And you got to wait for people to come your way. You got to, I remember, you know, you just want to force people to change sometimes. You know how that feeling is? You just want to force them to change. You got a spouse who's got an addiction problem. You just want to force them to change so you nag them all the time. You know what? You know what I learned from al -Anon? Say it once and shut up. Say it once. Sit down with them. Ask them what Jesus asked them. How's that going for you? Okay, okay. You hate it? You don't like it? You don't even like yourself? Okay. Well, please stop. And they will decide. And they will move towards you or they'll move away from you. But you don't have to keep nagging them. Let them come your way. Let them come to you. you. You probably, some of you have spent way too much energy going after sheep that are too bad. And they're just, they're, they're, they're running. Wait for them to come to you. Say it once. Um, I love this. When they get to the fire, um, we find out that Jesus made them breakfast. He washed their feet in John 13. He makes them breakfast in John 21. And in the middle, he dies for them. This is amazing. This is amazing. He just forgave all their sins on the cross, and including them denying him. And then when he gets back and he sees them again, he doesn't say, hey, look what, look what I just did for you. I washed your feet, and then I died for you, and all this. And now, I'm cooking you breakfast. Now I'm cooking you breakfast. You see how low Jesus goes? How low he goes. You want to correct somebody? You want to be a shepherd? Cook them breakfast. You want to, you want to correct your kid? You want to correct your spouse? You want to correct your friend? You want to confront somebody? Learn a lesson from Jesus. Get on your knees and serve them. Bow before you correct. Jesus essentially bowed. He said, come, I'll serve you breakfast. When your kid does wrong, why not just get on your knees and get below their face and look up to them and say, that hurts me when you do that. Why not? Why, why be so up here to people? Because Jesus never did that. He went down here with people. Lower still. Lower still. Jesus is laid down in front of his disciples in humility. 
And that is the secret to how you be a shepherd. Is you don't come in on your high horse and you don't jump to the point to the point of faking. Ecclesiastes says there's a proper time and place to approach the king. There's a proper time and place to approach anybody. And you have no right to correct them anyways. So go lower than Jesus. And when you go lower than him, let's see what happens. And to see how much, see how much effect you have. He confronts these guys. He doesn't hold back. He confronts them. But, he, but wait and see how he does it. He, he does it after he cooks some breakfast. He goes lower still. And this is how we become shepherds in our world. So much I could preach, y'all. Y'all here? Can you resist him? He made a charcoal fire. Made a charcoal fire. Now, this word charcoal fire is only used twice in the Bible. And it's used the time that Peter went up behind Jesus as Jesus was on the tribunal. And he sat around a fire at night a couple days ago. And he denied Jesus how many times? So here we are again. We're at a charcoal fire. We're in a circle. And we confess Jesus how many times? Because he's, he's asked you, he asked him three times. He's restoring him. And he gives him that charcoal fire experience again. Counselors call it a redo. You, you, you mess up. You know, there's the option of stuffing it. And Jesus could have shown up and said, you know, it's a new day. Just forget about the past. Don't worry about it. He didn't do that. He went back and he surgically took care of business. And sometimes you got to go back to go forward. Sometimes you got to go back. Shepherds are so smooth, man. Sometimes you got to go back and not stuff the past, but uncover the past. And he's reminding him without reminding him of the time he denied him. Right there at the charcoal fire experience. This is genius. He set this thing up like a pro. And you can't, you can't do this unless somehow God sets it up for you. If you want to talk to that person, pray for this kind of experience. Because you'll win. Because Jesus was suave, my friends. He was a suave shepherd. He set up the charcoal experience. And then he said, Peter, he started with the words, Do you love me more than these? Because Peter had said, I love you more than all the disciples. And even if everybody leaves you, I never will. A couple hours later, he was denying him. And so Jesus is like, do you love me more than these, Peter? Now notice he doesn't say, you idiot. You clearly don't love me more than these. Now I've proven it. But what he says is, do you really? He almost works his whole process with questions. He rarely does a, you should. He just does a, hey, really? Because he actually wants the person to feel the grief. He wants them to relive the trauma. If you're a counselor, there's so much in this story, I don't even know how to, I, I, I can't even go there. But Jesus is like, let's go back. Do you really love me more than these? Do you remember those words you said? He wants him to feel that, that, that thing, that time when he departed. And then he answers them three times. He's like, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And every time it's yes, yes, yes. He's, 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 he's moving Peter and the disciples to grief. And he's bringing them in the most gentle way to a terrible confrontation. And look how he does it. He literally holds their hand, walks them back, and lets them see their own depravity. Jesus doesn't shy away from confrontation. It's just that he's a genius when he does it. It's just that he's a shepherd when he does it. And he confronts. And, and guys, every father in here needs to repent today. Every mother in here needs to repent today. Everybody who's a friend in here needs to repent today. We don't know how to talk to each other. 
we still, as old as we are, do not know how to talk to our spouses, do not know how to talk to our kids, do not know how to talk to each other. We don't go low enough. We don't wait on God enough. And we're not gentle enough. And Jesus walks him back. Now, he wants you to know you're a sinner. He does. But see how gently he takes you there? You see how gently he took Peter there? And now Peter can only say, but by the grace of God, I'm saved. Because he walked him back. Man, as I'm reading this and saying this, I wish, I wish I could say I was good at that. But I'm not. He says, do you love me? Three times he takes him back. And then he says to him, feed my sheep. He's not done until he restores him to ministry. He's not done with him until he restores him back. And there's this whole debate among Christians is when somebody sins really big, should you restore them back to ministry? I kind of used to say no. But this is making me rethink it. Because after he denied him three times, Jesus wasn't done reconciling him until he restored him. And he put him back in charge of the disciples. He says, Peter, now you go feed my sheep again. Get back in the game. Some of you have been out of the game. Some of you have been out of the game and not even playing the game. Some of you know people like that. There's a lot in here. Jesus is saying, I want to reconcile you. I got to tell you some things that are going to be hard. And then when I'm done, I'm putting you back in the game. And then he tells him this really strict statement. He says, when you get old, they're going to tack you to a cross and they're going to hang you. That's what that meant. When they're going to carry you around, when you're going to stretch you out, they're going to kill you. And, and I looked at that first and I thought, wow, Jesus, that's kind of, that's kind of tough words. Well, sometimes you've got to say tough words. And what's cool about that is Jesus tells Peter, this time you're going to win. This time you're not going to deny me. This time when you get up to bat, you're going to hit a grand slam. This time when they ask you, do you believe in Jesus? You're going to say yes, and they're going to kill you just like they killed me. And there's a story in the Acts of Peter. It's a historical document outside of the Bible. Peter, during the persecutions of Nero, they were killing Christians and hanging them on crosses and burning them with fire. Okay? Kind of cool. Not. And then Peter's like, I don't want to be burned with fire. So he left the city. And as he was leaving the city, he saw someone going into the city, and it was Jesus. And, and Jesus, actually, Peter asked Jesus, where are you going? And Jesus says, to be crucified, where are you going? And so Peter turns around, goes back into the city, and the tradition is he wouldn't even let him crucify him head up because he didn't want to, he didn't feel honored enough to be crucified like Jesus. So they literally crucify the guy upside down. Now this story's told in like three different places. I'm telling you, it's a historical, it's historically true, it's just not in the Bible. I think it's historically true anyways. And it's prophesied right here by Jesus. Jesus says, you're gonna win, man. He says, it's gonna hurt. You're gonna have eternal victory with me. You're gonna go out there and you're gonna hit a grand slam. It's gonna be great. You're gonna win. He restores them, he gives them strength, he's the shepherd. And I want you guys to be reconciled to God. I want you guys to go the way. And we've got people that can take you there. We've got Karen Close that can take you there. We got Bogan that can take you there. I'm still learning, okay? We'll talk if you wanna to talk to me. But if you, you do have to go back before you go forward. And you are gonna to have to uncover where you went wrong. And that is going to not only reconcile you, it's going to restore you and put you back in the game, and you're going to win this time. And this is what Jesus offers us. He offers us reconciliation. So we come to the table today. We think about being reconciled to him. If you have not been reconciled to God, maybe this is not a day to take this. If you have been reconciled to God, then take it. And obviously, that puts a little bit of thought in your mind is that what is the best thing for me to do here? Because the Bible says when you take my body, my blood, you need to think about your relationship to me. And maybe you need to get right with me before you take it. And the Bible talks about that in 1 Corinthians 11. So think about that this morning. Ask yourself, 
if you're ready. And if not, confess your sins to the Lord and take communion with me this morning. Father, I don't know, I don't know how to be a shepherd, but I'm so impressed with Jesus, the shepherd. And right now, Lord, I just beg you to send the shepherds. Lord, we've, we've done wrong in how we've loved other people. And we have not been shepherds of people. And we don't go low. We don't care. We don't love like him. God, forgive us. Make us like shepherds. Send us a shepherd just like this so that people can just be healed all over the place. Send us the shepherd so that the lost and the straying have a place to come home to. Father, send us all the gifts. We got to have this one. Got to have the apostles. We got to have the prophets. We got to have the evangelists. We got to have the shepherds. We got to have the teachers, Lord. But today, send us the shepherds. Oh, God. Thank you for Jesus. We just worship him right now because he's so good with us. And I can't resist him. And he makes me feel desperate. And I am. I'm desperate for him. And I pray that you'll give us this desperation so we can come closer and be more like him. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may stand to your feet and worship. Our eyes to the giver of life, you alone can pray. 
rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise. praise. Amen. Y'all want to go out into the world with some energy? Let's sing this last song together. Yes, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of It was my tomb till I met you. Yeah, I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. Till I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Yes, out of the darkness into your glorious day. Yes, you called my name. To your glorious day. Yes, now your mercy has saved my soul. Thank you, God. And now your freedom is all that I know. The old name knew. Jesus, when I met you. Oh, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Yes, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. Cause when you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, shepherd of our soul, Jesus, you're so beautiful. And we rest our souls in your loving hands. God, we just want you to be our shepherd and we receive from your wisdom and from your, from your goodness, Lord. Thank you. You're so beautiful, Jesus. Mm. Who wants Jesus to be their shepherd? I do. He's amazing. He's so amazing. Um, I'm just amazed by that story. Um, 
So my challenge for you guys this morning is just two words. And um, even though maybe we're not all shepherds, we all want to be more like Jesus. And so we're all going to try this. The two words are lower still, lower still. Can we this week go lower still like Jesus did? I don't know what situation God's going to bring you into whether it's a parenting situation, whether it's a lunch with a friend, whether it's something with your spouse. But in that moment, can you remember Jesus' amazing wisdom and his shepherding example and just take a lower position? How can you serve that person? How can you go lower still? Can you look in the eyes of your toddler? Can you look in the eyes of your spouse? Can you serve them? So that's the challenge for this week is lower still. And then my second challenge and last thing I'll say is um, go out on a limb and invite someone to the Super Bowl party because we're going to have a lot of fun and we're really excited about that and we want to invite the community and we want to bring them in. They're not, we're, you know, it might be hard for them to come to church, but we want them to come here. So um, we're going to do a Super Bowl party where it's more comfortable for them and it's all for reaching out. So um, that's my challenge for you guys this week. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you tonight.